great privilege to welcome back to the Nelson Mandela Bay Life Work Leadership Journey, someone that's in a very short period of time become someone that we have, um, we've come to know and love and definitely enjoy listening to. So always speaking with such great passion and when he breaks open the Word of God in a unique way. Let us give a virtual clap and welcome to Stephen French. Um, so Stephen, it's such a great privilege to have you back. We're looking forward for this Jesus journey. Um, and the, the floor is yours. Well, a lot has happened since we have been together. Uh, I came home on an airplane, and little did I know that that would be one of my last airplane trips in a long time. I told someone yesterday that I am such a personable person that I am ready to jump on an airplane now and get into a middle seat so that I can just talk to two people on either side of me. Uh, I just want to be near people again and give them bear hugs and, uh, and just be right up close with them. So we will look forward to that day. We have received some good news here on this side. Uh, as you recall, I live in Orlando, and uh, news just came out yesterday that uh, we will be opening up our amusement parks, Disney and Universal and a few other parks here, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so we are excited about having people come back to Orlando. And uh, of course, uh, I'm very fortunate at this time in my life not to have any children living in the house. So I have not had to worry about the school and, and all the many things that you mothers and fathers have had to just go through. Uh, you never realized how great those teachers were until you have to be the teacher, I guess. Uh, so anyway, such a pleasure. Such a pleasure to see everyone. And uh, I'm, I'm just really excited about spending the next 20, 25 minutes with you uh, just talking to you about what I'm passionate about, and that is Jesus. Uh, particularly as we take a look at not just at his life, but through the lenses of leadership. I mean, to think about it, that Jesus actually not only has a life that's worth emulating and, and following, but he's got a leadership uh, model that's worth looking at and following as well. So uh, if you have your workbooks and you haven't turned to page 61 and 62, I certainly want you to do that. Um, I want to start off, however, with, with a, just an example of a, uh, something that's really kind of hit me uh, recently. Uh, the historian Rodney Starks out of Baylor University in Texas here in the U.S., has written a fascinating book called The Rise of Christianity. And he skillfully outlines the rise of Christianity in the 300 years that followed Jesus here on earth. Now, Starks states that not only did the common people, but all sectors of business, commerce, and power were greatly influenced by Christianity, so much so that by the year 313, Constantine the Great, the emperor of the Roman Empire, was converted to Christianity and declared Christianity the world religion. He was also responsible for a few years later for the influence in the Council of Nicaea in 325, which became known as the Nicene Creed, which today, of course, is held as the foundational and unifying statement of the Christian faith. But I started thinking, what caused Christianity to rise over those 300 years from merely obscurity to prominence? Well, Starks chronicles those 300 years very carefully, and it's summed up. The reason for this rise is summed up in one word, compassion. Compassion. Now, you turn into the book of Acts, and the first couple of chapters shows us the, not the first 300 years, but the, basically the first 30, 40, 50 days after Jesus had left the earth. You wonder, what are these 12 business guys going to do with the Jesus journey? They had seen him journey for the last three and a half years. He had tried to set a model of how to do business, how to do life, right? What are they going to do after he leaves? Will it continue on? 
And of course, you recall Acts chapter one and Acts chapter two and th wait, three, chapter four, chapter five. Ch you turn those pages and the first number of chapters are all about what? Compassion. I mean, you hear stories uh, where they are sharing everything with one another in Acts chapter two. Then they see someone who's lame and sick and they touch them. The, you, you, you see so many, you see in chapter six about how the people aren't getting fed and they're going to restructure their organization so that the poor people get fed. They absolutely decided to take what Jesus had done and they're going to show compassion. Well, this continues on so much so that in 50 AD, just about 20 years after Jesus had gone up into heaven, the Greeks in Thessalonica, where you get the book of Thessalonians, says that they are turning the whole world upside down. What's with these Christians? They're showing compassion, and this world is being turned upside down. A hundred years later, there's plagues, maybe even a coronavirus. I don't know what it was, but there were plagues all around the world, and particularly in their parts of the world. And it said that they were just being bodies of Dead people were being loaded onto carts and just massive graves, graves were being built. And people were dying by the hundreds and thousands during this plague, 150 years after Christ had left. And what was amazing is that several historians during that time noted that as people were fleeing the cities and running to the hills to distance themselves, we had Christians going into the city and actually trying to figure out how can we help these people who are being abandoned. Yes, the idea of the rise of Christianity was because of compassion. And I believe even in this day with these plagues, at this time, that the rise of Christianity can occur because if you have some business leaders who decide, I'm going to take the Jesus model seriously, and I'm going to live and lead like Jesus. Well, what I want to do now is just kind of show you a chart that Vickers will put up on the screen. And this chart is much like the one that you have on page 60 of your workbook. At the bottom of page 60, you see that kind of that chart that's kind of down at the bottom that kind of shows you the timeline of, of, the, uh, of the life of Jesus and the leadership of Jesus. But what I want to do is now sh show you this chart, just kind of give you a different feel for it, to just kind of show you where we have been thus far. And you see that. I mean, you see what we spent together. We talked about the preparation period, those first 30 years, and we did an introduction session. We talked about the foundation of preparation. Remember, I made the point that that preparation was 90% of what Jesus did, preparation, that 30 out of the 33 years was spent in quiet preparation. And remember, we talked about calling and the importance of the primary call and the secondary call, that the primary call is to follow Jesus. And then we were, then we were concerned about the secondary call as we follow Jesus. That now, we also talked about knowing God, and then we ended our retreat together by talking about relationships. We got into that training period, those, those first three years. And we remember I shared that story about the woman at the well and how Jesus sat down. And it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He was so interested in people who were not just um, poor, but he was interested in people that didn't look quite like him. He wanted his leadership team to have a diversity of relationships. And over the last couple of, um, of months, we've been looking at these other subjects. Now, after 
that training period of three years, if you were to cut that in half, 36 months, those three years, if you cut that in half, and 18 months, the first 18 months was all spent in developing relationships. And how many miracles does he do during that time? Only two miracles. And remember I shared with you that Jesus is not attracting people because of miracles. He knows that if you attract them with miracles, that's how you have to end up retaining them. Any smart business leader knows that if you're going to attract people into your company, into your organization with perks, with bonuses, with promises of miracles, guess how you have to end up ret retaining them and keeping them? you got to keep them the same way you attract them. But if you attract them through relationships, that's how you end up retaining them. And that's what Jesus did. He spent 18 months hardly doing any miracles. And after 18 months, he prays one night and he, he asked 12 of the, of the hundreds of people that are following him, 12 of them to come follow him on a, almost a day-by-day -day basis. And one of the very first things that he did was to have the Sermon on the Mount, which is his worldview. So the very first thing that he does in a, with his leadership team is he says, guys, listen, the world says, blessed are they who do this, but I say, blessed are they who do this. Some people say, you should do it this way, but I say, blessed are they who do it this way. And he is making on the Sermon on the Mount one week after he has chosen the 12. He's giving his people in his business, his organization, the state of a, a state of this is the way that I see things. This is my worldview. This is the way our company, this is the way our organization is going to see things. And that's what he does. And then during that time, he talks about in that same sermon, he talks about generosity, and we just focused in on that last month. So I thank you for that chart. I hope that kind of gives you a little bit of a feel for how Jesus is really strategically thinking through things. Now, we're at compassion. How does that fit in to the Jesus journey? Well, I think it's really kind of clear is that now, Jesus can start doing miracles. And most of his miracles are focused in on compassionate things for people. It's not all about, hey, look at me. I'll just, you know, bring, bring all the spotlight on me. But he's, no, as he's walking along, he's going to touch different people. He's going to stay alert that as he does life, as he does his business, He's just staying alert to what is the father telling me? What is he saying? Where is he moving me toward? And I'm going to respond and just enjoy today. I mean, I'm just going to kind of go and I'm going to stay alert to what my kids need, what my colleagues need, what my friends. I'm just going to do life. And as I do life, if there's a moment to touch someone with some compassion, oh, that would be great. Now, mind you, the compassion that Jesus does isn't just kind of haphazard, but he was, he was strategic. For instance, uh, if you were, and you can just write this down in the side columns on page 61 and 62 in your workbooks, you can just take a few notes right there along with the, the words that are written there. But you might want to just put somewhere, maybe on the bottom of page 62, just a Luke chapter 4. And Luke chapter 4 after Jesus had come out of his baptism, he was strategic, and he tells his followers, I just want to kind of give you, in the U.S., when the president gets uh, uh, brought into office, he, they, he makes his inaugural address. He just wants to kind of address what's really important to him and what the president is going to do over the next four years while he's in office. Well, this is Jesus' inaugural address where after his baptism, he just basically lets say, anyone's going to follow me. I just want you to know, here is my agenda. And he says in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. To do what? 
to preach good news to the rich. No, I'm sorry, I missed that. Good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release, to release the oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so here at the outset, strategically, Jesus is basically saying, if you're at all interested in following me, being a part of my company, being a part of my organization, I just want you to know this is my agenda. Ultimately, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be showing a lot of acts of compassion. This is critical to my agenda. And so I got curious and I started taking a look at the different times that Jesus really kind of showed them. And as you know, the Bible is just full. I mean, this is the time right now. You know, a year and a half previously to this, he's quiet, 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 just developing relationships. But now he's got his team. If they're going to experience growth, he can actually handle the growth because he's got a team that he really believes in. And so he now begins to do miracles. And this is where there's so many people that started following him. Because just as like if your company did something really special for your city, and the newspaper decided to write an article about that. Why? Because it's just un so unusual. Why would people show compassion toward one another, right? Well, then you start getting a good, good press. You start getting uh, you know, all sorts of good things coming your way. Compassion seems to do that. And Jesus starts doing miracles and touching people. But I remembered that there were four times when Jesus cried. In scripture, there's four times where he cried. Now, he may have cried a bunch more, but I find now that I'm now in my early 60s, I, am, I tend to be crying a little bit more than what I used to. Like, you know, back when I was 30 and 40, man, you know, nothing moved me. I'm strong. I'm courageous. I'm a small guy, but no one's going to make me cry. And now it doesn't take a whole lot for this old guy to start crying. I don't know what it is, but I'm getting really weak in my old age. Uh, so, but Jesus cries. Now, a couple of ones that you would be aware of. Oh, and all of these references, by the way, are at the bottom of page 62 in your footnotes. You'll see them. So you can kind of just circle them if you want to along the way. But Luke chapter 10 talks about what? <laughs> The, it's the Good Samaritan, right? Oh my goodness, Jesus, would you please leave Samaritans alone? You've told us about the story. You took us through Samaria. You sat down. You talked to a woman, of all things, and a Samaritan woman that's got a checkered past. Would you please leave the Samaritan thing alone? No, 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 no. I'm going to tell you a story. I got a story to tell you about this Good Samaritan. Oh my goodness. And they're, now they're even a Good Samaritan? Yeah, so the story, as you know, all the religious and all the people kind of walk by this guy that is hurt on the side. But of all people, the Samaritan ends up meeting the needs of someone that was hurt. And the, the Bible says that Jesus had compassion. You know what the word compassion means in, in the Bible when the word's used four or five times in the Bible in the New Testament? It means to spill one, one's guts out. You remember the couple of times in your life when you cried and you literally feel like, <sighs> and you, you can barely catch your breath. You are just so, so sad. You're be, some people would use the word, I'm just emotionally destroyed. There is no greater, deeper word for compassion than the words that are used here in these four stories. Jesus had compassion. I mean, it just wasn't a thing, well, oh, I feel so bad for the person. No, it was, <gasps> it was that type of feeling that Jesus had. You remember the story in John chapter 11. 
The shortest verse in the Bible is John chapter 11, verse 35, and it says this, and Jesus wept. The same word. He wept for a lost friend, Lazarus. He had just passed away. This past Saturday, I experienced um, the loss of my mentor, uh, my youth pastor when I was a young boy. Uh, he went home to be with the Lord. And there was a funeral online uh, where uh, we just sat down and we watched the funeral. And um, there was a, a song that the, my youth pastor always would sing uh, at the end of a, a, a service in which we would share the Lord with high school kids. And uh, many kids came to know Christ. And it, it just, he deeply influenced me like no other man had. And that song came on, and I'm, I'm fighting it now. Um, I started crying. And um, it wasn't just that cry, you know. It was that <laughs> Sharon, uh, my wife, comes over and uh, sees what's going on, and she just puts her hands on my shoulder. And, um, and she could just feel my, my whole body just going up and down, up and down. And it was that kind of loss. It was that kind of loss. And, uh, and Jesus wept for Lazarus. And um, it says in, Luke, in Matthew chapter 9 that he cries again. This is the time in which he sees people. And he sees them without a shepherd. And, and the Bible says that they were scattered and harassed like sheep without a shepherd. And of course, one of the major, major things that shepherds do well is that they lead people. They lead people. And when you do not lead people well, when your kids are not being led well, when your colleagues at work aren't being led well, it breaks his heart. Jesus looks at people and he sees a sheep without a shepherd. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to step up and step in to people's lives and to know that this is Jesus' heart, that we would be a good shepherd for the people around us. And then, of course, the final time is found in Luke chapter 19. And it's all about Jesus coming into the last week of his life here on earth. And he looks over a city and he weeps. And this is the vision of life work leadership. The mission is transforming leaders, but the vision is transforming a city. To have some life work alumni that would look over their city and have such a burden for their city that it would bring them to tears. This is what is our dream, that you would see beyond just your family, see just beyond your company, and decide together, I live in this city. I want my heart to break for the things that Jesus' heart breaks for as well. How about you? Do you have a compassion for your city? A lot of people say, well, how do I get a compassion? Well, I think we primarily, first of all, follow the life of Jesus more closely so that we can hear the things that he's hearing. Just like he stayed close to the Father to hear the things that he, he says, I can do nothing unless the Father shows me. To stay so close to him that you can hear the things that Jesus is hearing. You can see the things that he's seen, that you can see him starting to reach out to that particular person to be able to touch them. And I'm convinced that a lot of times it's just a matter of beginning to intentionally move toward the things and the people that break the heart of Jesus, and he will shape your heart. You don't sit back and you just say, I hope someday I get a little bit of compassion. 
No, there is this sense of I have enough faith in what Jesus has modeled for me that I will begin in just pure obedience to begin to move toward the people that breaks Jesus' heart. And I will intentionally begin to move. And it may even be strategically. Maybe it's in your workplace. The Bible says primarily, who are you to have compassion for? It's your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? It's that who is close to you. So you start with not just your family, but you also start with the people nearby you at work. It's kind of funny to talk about nearby you right now in this time of distancing. But there will come a time when you're going to long to be nearby others again. When that happens, you need to stay alert. That's your primary point of compassion is your neighbor, is to be love your neighbor as yourself. And as you then, as a company, as a church, as a family, begin to intentionally move toward people in your city, strategically perhaps. Maybe you leverage not just your family, but your church together. Maybe it's your church and your company that together you decide we're going to spend some time focused in on this group of people or this project, whatever it might be. But to be really, really intentional. You know, um, this rise of Christianity had a lot to do with a diversity in ethnicity. So it just wasn't Galileans. It was Judeans. It was Samaritans. It ended up being Greeks. It ended up being Romans. It was the rise of Christianity with the diversity of skin color, the diversity of roles. It just wasn't for common folks. It was the, with, for the powerful as well. Different skill sets. Jesus sees this vision of compassion that it's just not, uh, it's diverse with skin. It's diverse in roles. It's diverse in skills. It's diverse in backgrounds. It's diverse with education. But there's something quite powerful when we all have a common passion. Yes, that is the word for compassion, having a common passion. So, how about it? How about not just living like Jesus, but leading like Jesus as well? I want to put one final picture up on the screen for you. And if there was one picture to describe compassion. I think it might be this. You know who she is. If there is one person in the world that captures compassion, it's Mother Teresa. A business guy uh, who uh, works here in the U.S. got a chance to, uh, to meet her. And uh, I, I asked him about it, and he said it was, it was amazing. And he said, I, I thought I'd be really smart and just ask her. So how did God call you to serve the poor? And she looks this little, small little lady who's not even barely five foot. She looks up at him and says, I was not called to serve the poor. And my friend was dumbfounded. She spent her entire life practically serving the poor in Calcutta, India. She says, I didn't call, I wasn't called to serve the poor, but rather, I was called to serve Jesus, and he led me here. Oh. I'm convinced that if you are committed to following Jesus, he will take on the responsibility of leading you where you need to go to serve with compassion. I love you guys. I'm just so convinced that you have gone through life work for such a time as this. Oh, just, just follow Jesus. He's, it's a smart and it's a biblical model to follow. 